I saw in the Russian Orthodox Church the traditional. It was probably something that I'd been searching for up until then and didn't fully know quite what it was. It brought me head on in collision with the whole idea of tradition with a capital T. I remember the Archbishop asking me to compose a setting of the liturgy without knowing anything about how liturgical music was written in the Orthodox Church, and it caused an uproar in the church. And I wrote a kind of Stravinskyan setting of the liturgy with a kind of studied antiquity. Everybody came up to me saying, you know, where's tradition in your music? We don't hear anything. It's all your own music. This event brought me face to face with the concept of tradition. It was then that I started making friends with Indian musicians, Sufi musicians, musicians from all sorts of other cultures, so I could really understand what tradition really was. I was talking to icon painters about tradition. I was talking to people who knew about Hindu miniatures, all Buddhist art. I remember looking at statues of the Buddha and being totally overwhelmed by it. My goodness, was that a muse to me. Looking at this art, I thought, where, where, where does this wonderful art come from? How is it possible to create in the 20th century an art that touches, uh, even matches in the slightest degree any of this art? And this brought about in me a silence for, for a fairly long period of time. I remember I travelled to Greece, went to the island of Egina, stayed there and just didn't write anything, but tried to soak myself in the tradition of the Orthodox Church. Mother Thekla, I think, helped me to create a musical language that was having with it a kind of hidden metaphysical agenda. So I had to build up a traditional language because the no traditional language existed or does exist in our times. We have to somehow reinvent this. You know, icon painters, they just copy or sometimes just trace icons. But Mother Thecla was a very practical lady and she was very able to help me by what she said uh, about given texts, for example, saying, well, this refers to this and that refers to the other and this refers to something else metaphysically. I was therefore able to imbue the music. She drew huge charts around a given subject or a given text saying, this refers to the bridal chamber. This refers to the concept of divine eros, etc., etc., etc. So I was able to close my music with a kind of inner metaphysical truth. After all, art should contain both beauty and truth. There is that wonderful saying of Islam, God is a beautiful being and he loves beauty. Now, there's no other reason for music to exist at all other than the fact that it is beautiful. And Plato says, beauty is the splendor of the true. If it can be both those two things, then it's worth writing. Mother Thackeray was a rather wildly eccentric person, I think. A person who had a fearsome temper and a person to whom you could say absolutely anything. One thing she did not have was any kind of conventional piety. And at this time, I used to bother her quite a lot. Sometimes rather late at night, I seem to remember ringing her up, asking the precise meaning of a given phrase that I was about to write. I wanted to check with it metaphysically so that I got it right, as it were. And Mother Thekla never, she was marvellous. She would tolerate being woken up at two o'clock in the morning by me. 
If one is going to create this eternal celestial music, one has got to listen, to be silent, to hear the angel of inspiration dictate. It may sound strange in the beginning of the 21st century for a composer to talk about music being received by the angel of inspiration, but my feeling is that it's no longer a question of 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. This is how you could have described music, certainly up to a point for the last 300 years. But I think now it has to change. We have to, I feel, from my own music, it must be 90% inspiration and 10% perspiration. Because one must listen to the angel of inspiration. And one must try to create a kind of music that is almost instantaneous. I think nowadays, if I have to work over long on getting something right, I dismiss it and I throw it into the waste paper basket because otherwise one doesn't want a lot of existential angst to be pushed out of my room. I've no right to subject an audience to existential angst. They don't want to hear about my waste. They want to hear what is inspired. They don't want to hear the music of John Tavner. Who wants to hear the music of John Tavner? One wants to hear the music that has come through the channel of John Tavner, that has been dictated by the angel of inspiration. God chooses all of us. He chooses all of us to do different things. If he chose me, as I believe he did, in order to write music, that's all I must do. In order to fulfill my karma, I must just write music, and it must become as beautiful as it possibly can, because God is a beautiful being, and he loves beauty. And there is no other reason, as I've said before, for music to exist. You take the medieval composers, or you take the great period of Sufism in the 12th century back in Persia, or you take the great Hindu masters, or the great improvisers that exist today in India, they will all say music is divinely inspired. I mean, it would be insane to any of these people to suggest it was any other way. What is out of sync is the 21st century, and if I may say so, the 20th century, the 19th century, and the 18th century. That, the centuries are out of sync. We do live, of course, at the end of the Hindu cycle, the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, and it is therefore not surprising that music has become the way it has become. Not only music, art in general. Not only art, the way the world is in general. <laughs> 